The latest tech. I'm Alexa. I can answer your questions. Interviews. And we are evolving and we are seeing an amazing opportunity that is happening. Accessibility. Accessibility is, is one of our core values. This is Double Tap TV. Welcome to Double Tap TV, guys. Thanks for being here. If you want to get involved, please email us. Feedback at ami.ca is our email address. On Twitter, we are at Double Tap Canada. And use that hashtag, which is Ask Double Tap. I am Mark Aflalo, joined every week by Stephen Scott. Stephen, this time of year is always exciting in tech, but this week in particular is an exciting one for us here at Double Tap. It is iPhone week. Yay, finally. <laughs> Stephen, you know, this week we're also joined by a familiar face to us and to our viewers. Mitchell Whitfield is here to help us decipher all the latest iPhone releases. Hi, Mitchell. How you doing? Hi, guys. Good to see you again. You know, I got very excited when you were saying why this week was so exciting. I really thought you were going to say because of me. But yes, yay for iPhones also. That's what he Come meant, on, we're excited. Mitchell. That's what he meant. <laughs> That's exactly Thank what you, I Stephen. meant, Mitchell. Thank you, Stephen. Thanks for throwing me a bone. I'm excited yes. because you're here. <laughs> 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 Guys, before we before we unveil and dive into the latest iPhones from Apple, there are four new models this year, and it's important to talk about the history and significance of the iPhone in general, which will help everyone understand why the entire industry gets all giddy when it comes to this time of the year. Stephen, so why don't you kind of dive back in time a little bit? Sicily, 1952. I uh, know, back in 2007, when Steve Jobs unveiled the first iPhone. Yeah, it was a really important time. I mean, you know, I guess I maybe go back a little bit um, to the point more when voiceover was introduced, when, you know, this slab of glass that appeared in front of us all for the first time around uh, when the original iPhone came out and we all thought as blind people, how is this going to work for us? And truthfully, we didn't think it ever would. Uh, and then voiceover was introduced a couple of years later. A lot of people don't realize that. It wasn't part of the original design, uh, but actually it was brought in later and it made a slab of glass to blind people suddenly useful as a phone, to text, to download apps and all of those great things. It really did change the world uh, as, as it promised that it would and in a really positive way for so many people. Mitchell, you know, how has the iPhone in, in your mind shaped the smartphone industry as we know it today? Well, I, I don't think it shaped the industry. I think it created the industry. If you look at what came before, uh, most notably the Motorola and the Nokia phones that had screens on them and had fixed buttons on them, uh, that was the closest thing we had to a smartphone, but you didn't have a reactive, you know, a capacitive touch screen, uh, any sort of screen that really gave information more than what was built on the phone when it shipped. And I think the most important thing about what Steve Jobs said in that keynote that rang true to a lot of people is, yes, how, how could a smartphone be smart if, in fact, you had all these embedded buttons that were built into the device that did not change over time as apps as your apps change, you know, the, the button stayed the same. So to have this slab of glass, as Stephen said, uh, was so important because it opened up the possibilities of having new software constantly evolve this brick into something different every year, even though, of course, there's a new phone every year, which we'll talk about maybe at a different time. Uh, it really created the smartphone industry. So whether you're an Android fan or, you know, going back to Windows and all, whatever kind of phone you love, even if you don't love Apple and don't love the iPhone, you really owe it all to Apple because they started and created this entire smartphone segment. You know, these phones are called the iPhone 12, but they're actually the 25th, 26th, 27th, and 28th <laughs> iteration of the iPhone since that day in 2007. Wow. Now, that, that's you know counting every S model and every SE model. So, so at this point, while the iPhone 12 lineup is brand new, Apple at this point is no longer new to the game. They're more experienced than actually most of the brands that we're even used to these days, Stephen. Yeah, they are. And it, like you say, I mean, they've been around for a long time. I didn't realize that was the uh, numbers we were up to in terms of the new iPhones. That's quite incredible, actually, uh, when you think about it. Uh, but no, they are. I mean, they're, they're good at this. They're used to this now. They've been doing this for a long time. We've got past the point where, you know, you're holding the phone the wrong way uh, because they put the aerials on incorrectly on models. Uh, you know, we've gone past all that nonsense. They, they know how to build a phone. They know how to they know how to make it sexy. And that's the that's the point. You know, I mean, Apple devices, Whenever they, you know, show up on, on the videos when they, they announce these new phones, they're always, they just look so good, the, the design is good. But interestingly, especially with the iPhone 12 line, they've been going back to an old design. You know, I'm thinking back to the iPhone 4 and the iPhone 4S and the original iPhone SE. 
uh, that has the design very similar of today's, uh, hopefully without the aerial issues. Um, so, you know, I, I think that, you know, they clearly know what they're doing in terms of the design. That's something they've always got right. Uh, but, um, yeah, I, I think they're, they're certainly in a good place. They know what they're doing. And, of course, the new thing this year is 5G. That's what they're focusing in on. What happens uh, with 5G? How good will that be? Well, of course, depend on the networks themselves. But, you know, again, they're evolving. They're, you know, adapting to new challenges, new ways of connecting. And uh, these phones will just, uh, you know, continue to be popular as they always are. Let's dive into these models, guys. The design, the technology, what really sets them apart. And we're going to do that after we take a quick break. This is Double Tap TV. We'll be back in just a moment. Love Double Tap TV? Listen to AMI-audio for Double Tap Canada every Thursday at 8 p.m. Eastern for news and reviews on everything tech. This is Double Tap TV. Welcome back to Double Tap TV. Thank you guys so much for being here with us. I am Mark Aflalo with Stephen Scott, and this week Mitchell Whitfield joins us for the iPhone 12 ride. Uh, Stephen, let's start with the four different models available for this calendar year. Let's dive into those, you know, I guess, all four <laughs> of them from smallest to largest, I guess, is a good order. Yeah. Yeah, okay. Well, uh, from the smallest one then, you're starting with the iPhone 12 mini in that case. Uh, they did finally do it. They brought out a smaller version of this uh, standard flagship device that they have. Uh, and it's even smaller than my favorite iPhone of the moment, which is the iPhone SE. With its 4.7 inch screen, uh, what they've actually done is they've managed to shrink uh, the borders around the device, around the screen, to actually make a, a larger screen more available in a smaller form factor, which is kind of incredible. So my iPhone SE is quite a large phone, uh, despite the fact it's only got a 4.7 inch screen. The iPhone 12 mini now has a 5.4 inch screen, but because it has pretty much no border around the screen at all, uh, and it's all screen, uh, you can get a 5.4 inch screen, bigger screen, smaller device. Mitchell, now if we talk about the design of the actual phones themselves, these all have you know a lot of features in common. So let's kind of try to describe exactly what these phones look like. Oh, sure. Well, first, they're all really pretty, and I mean beautiful pretty. Um, uh, well, let's talk about, first of all, just let's talk about the similarities. I think um, Stephen just touched on one. They all have 5G functionality. And again, Stephen, I agree, will that be enough in a, wor in a world where 5G is not everywhere? Um, they also all have OLED displays for the first time. You're no longer being punished for not having a pro device. So if you want to have those beautiful, vibrant colors, and more, more importantly, the contrast, which can also be very, very important, uh, you know, the OLED screen is going to benefit a lot of different people. And then, of course, you have the A14 Bionic chip on the inside, um, which powers all the devices. So, again, you're not being punished for having a the Mini, the, the regular, or the Pro. Depending on which one you have, if you have the lower model or the less expensive model, you're, these devices all have, every, you know, those things in common. Did you want me to talk a little bit about the, the body styles themselves and the material, Mark? Because I think that's a real big that's difference. Absolutely. Yeah, so... Um, the main difference that we're going to see in terms of the build of these phones, you have the mini and the regular iPhone 12. Those are going to have uh, aircraft, aircraft grade aluminum, I believe is what it's called, Mark. Beautiful aircraft grade aluminum build on it. And again, we have those flat sides, so they're very easy to grip. They feel great in the hand. And of course, it harkens back, as everyone's been talking about, to the original iPhone 4, where they flattened out the sides of the device and have a very polished, smooth feel. So once again, it makes it very easy to hold. Uh, the screen is a little bit more recessed this time, not as pronounced. Um, and you also have the materials, you know, themselves that have a very different feel to them. And the glass on the back, again, I don't know who this is going to appeal to, but you have the glass on the back this time for the regular iPhone 12 line, which has the sort of the, the matte finish of the aircraft grade aluminum, has the very see-through clear glass on the back, while the very shiny uh, surgical grade stainless steel on the Pro models has an opaque finish to the glass on the back. So aesthetically, the phones are going to look and feel a little different in the hand, but the nice part is because of that flat edge design, they will have that similar ability to grip them all. And I think that's a problem that some people have as these devices, and Stephen, you tell me what you think, as these devices have gotten thinner, they've also gotten a little harder to hold, but I think that flat edge on the side really really makes it not just feel better, but much easier to keep your phone safe in your hand. Yeah, again, I go back to my, my point about the iPhone 4 and the iPhone SE, that original chunky design 
that they had. And that was, that was something I really liked about those devices because they were easier to hold. Uh, much more, I believe, uh, and tell me if I'm wrong here, Mitchell, that it's very similar to the iPad Pro, the new iPad Pro line. So it's, it's not quite as chunky as, as the original iPhone 4s. It's maybe a little bit thinner, but the, but the design is, is much easier to hold. Guys, one of the newer things that's on all these phones this year is the reintroduction of a brand that Apple used to have, which was MagSafe. And if you remember this, this was the, you know, the actual feature that let you magnetically attach your power adapter to your you know, a MacBook Pro and the MacBook Airs, et cetera, et cetera. They got rid of it a while ago, but now they're reintroducing it on the iPhone 12, which I think is pretty significant because I don't know about you, Mitchell, but when I try to charge my phone, I find it hard to get that kind of sweet spot as to where I need to charge it on a wireless charger. But MagSafe is hopefully going to, you know, fix that problem. Uh, I always enjoyed MagSafe on the computer side because it protected a lot of people from having to go out and replace uh, their chargers because they would, if you kick the, the cord, instead of breaking, it would just pop off. So I, I always love that. And I'm sure as you guys have both discovered and a lot of uh, viewers and listeners have discovered on their own, wireless charging, although a great technology, is not always incredibly consistent. If you ever had to fuss with your phone to find the sweet spot on your charging pad to where the light would go on, it would start charging, then, then you know what I'm talking about. MagSafe kind of, a, you know, MagSafe eliminates that problem where the magnet will help the charger, which is also magnetized, immediately lock in so that you have that perfect charging point. That's great. But Apple is really introducing an entirely new ecosystem here, not just for charging, but for cases. The cases are gonna have, the Apple branded cases, I should say, are going to have built-in MagSafe as well. So once you put the case on top of the phone, there's an extra magnet built into the case itself. So it is still magnetized when you put that charging pad on there. So they have a whole ecosystem of products that are going to have MagSafe built in so they can attach not just to your phone directly, but also to the case. The one problem I had or question I had was they had a little wallet case that goes on the back of the phone that attaches just magnetically and I was wondering well as strong as a magnet can be how is it how is it gonna be when you try and slide that into your pocket well we've seen some videos I've seen Marquez Brownlee and some other youtubers and influencers put that phone into their pocket with that MagSafe wallet on the back and in fact it looks like the wallet can become detached as you slide it in if the pockets are kind of tight and if your pants are kind of tight which is a totally different visual issue but uh, there are gonna be some products that don't work as well as others but as you know as time goes on it'll be interesting interesting to see how not only Apple but third-party manufacturers take advantage of or use this new MagSafe technology I, I love the fact that, you know, for years, uh, for our lives, everybody's told us, keep magnets away from your credit cards. Keep magnets away from your wallet. And now we're actually building it into yeah. the wallet that magnetically attaches to our phones, which is Well, I will funny. say, I will say, built into the built into the wallet, because I did look into this, there is actually shielding built into the inside know, yeah. of the wallet where your credit cards are. So credit card strips all over the world will be safe. So I was, I thought the same thing, Mark, and we actually talked about it, but there is actually shielding inside the wallet to make sure that your cards don't become demagnetized while they're just sitting in your pants. Guys, this year we have two separate categories. We've got the pro category, and I guess you'd call it the regular category. Now, the only real difference here, other than the material, is on the pro side, you know, you get a better camera. This camera includes a telephoto lens, 60 frames per second video recording, four times optical zoom, Apple Pro Raw recording, night mode portraits. Um, the pro models also have a little bit brighter of a screen, 800 nits. Um, when it's in the non-HDR mode, but the biggest addition, in my opinion, and Stephen mentioned it earlier, is definitely that LiDAR sensor. And that really, really excites me. Stephen, what is the importance, especially on the accessibility side of things, with this new sensor? Well, this is the interesting thing. We just don't know at this point, but it seems it's all potential. Like most of these features that come out on any of these devices over the years, it's often the potential we see out of it. So what, what can it do? How does it actually work? And from my understanding, the way that it, it operates is it kind of uses its cameras. The phone uses the cameras to sort of survey an area, get a sense of depth, a sense of where things are, uh, using AI to recognize objects potentially, uh, even tell you, for example, measurements of something if you wanted to. I mean, I, I think the, the Measure app uses this kind of technology as well, you know, where it can sort of sense if you wanted to measure one distance to another. Um, you know, I, I, that's very early days uh, tech in this regard. And I think that it, it has got huge potential for all kinds of things. I mean, there's talk, for example, of being able to, as a blind person, use your camera use, on, on the back of your phone to point it at a desk and it will be able to tell you where the cup is on the desk. Now you think, well, okay, that 
You could use a camera for that. You could use some AI to tell you there's a cup there. But what if it's also able to tell you when you're near the cup, when the cup is actually you know, near your hand? Um, because it's using that depth sensor to be able to give you that information. I was, I was just gonna say, Stephen totally beat me to it because you can imagine someone who's blind, vision impaired, walking into a new space and not knowing what that room holds for them, holding up your phone. And again, the LiDAR, the best thing it does is 3D model a room. It can do it visually it, it, in this computing phase. It can do it, you know, visually and digitally. But giving those voice prompts in return, you can see, you know, the next level ideas in terms of how it can help people. Like you said, Stephen, the possibilities are endless. But just being able to walk into a new space and have that space mapped out by your phone and being able to communicate that to you quickly—that's huge. You know, guys, price points are all over the place when it comes to these new devices. So head on over to apple.ca and you can see where they range. They start about $979 Canadian. And you can see how, obviously, the, the price goes up depending on the model you choose and everything else that goes along with it. This is Double Tap TV. I am Marco Flalo with Stephen Scott. And this week, joined by Mitchell Whitfield. If you guys have an opinion, please let us know. The email address feedback at ami.ca. And on Twitter, we are at Double Tap Canada with that hashtag, which is Ask Double Tap. When we come back, we dive into the new features on the software side of things of the iPhone 12. Stick around. For more great Double Tap TV content, visit ami.ca slash Double Tap. This is Double Tap TV. We're back on Double Tap TV talking all things iPhone 12. Mark Aflalo with Stephen Scott and Mitchell Whitfield joins us this week. Mitchell, you wanted to bring up a fact that uh, we kind of omitted to mention when it comes to all of these devices and all of the packaging mm -hmm. with every new iPhone, even the older ones that are still available. Yeah, uh, you might notice the packages are a little smaller, which is nice. Smaller packages are good too. We all know the good things come in them. Uh, the thing is though, this year has been rumored, which has been rumored and now it's come true, you will no longer find a charging brick or headphones or earbuds uh, packaged in with your devices. And we knew this, we kind of knew this was coming. And Apple, of course, mentioned, you know, the ecological impact, which is true, better for the environment, less things, since a lot of people already have, you know, earbuds, already have charging bricks to have, you know, to keep on- More devices on the pallets exactly. so they can ship more at a time. So, you know, there's an ecological yeah. impact, which is great, but let's face it, um, there's also a financial impact. It, it, it ends up costing Apple a whole lot less to not have that charging brick in there and to not have supply the earphones yeah. and to sell them as, as an accessory device. The problem is, while everyone has USB-A, you know, the flat rectangular plugs or traditional USB charging bricks and plugs all over the place, not everyone has USB-C charging bricks all over the place. And that's what these new iPhones come with, a USB-C to lightning cable. So if you don't have a USB-C type adapter, which is far less typical than USB-A, you're gonna have to buy one from Apple for $19.99 US and of course priced accordingly elsewhere in the world. So while it may seem like a great move and it is a great move from an ecological standpoint, there are gonna be some people that are not happy that do not have a USB-C brick lying around. It's a good point. You know, earlier this year I got, I, don't, I can't remember if it was a Samsung phone or maybe an LG, and they actually included a USB-C to A adapter. So if you didn't have that brick, at least you had that adapter to go along with it. I thought that's what Apple would at least do, put a little adapter in there so people aren't punished for not having that brick. And I think at some point, mark my words, they will have to do that because enough people I think are gonna be upset by it. Something different that happened this year uh, is with the software. iOS 14 has actually been out for over a month now. And this year it came out earlier than the phones themselves, which is interesting because it gives us an opportunity to live with the software side of things before we actually have an opportunity to get on the phones. So I'm curious, Stephen, how do you think this affects people's behavior or desire to upgrade? Because I could tell you from my perspective that, you know, the software always makes me want to get that phone for a better experience. But this year, because I've been living with it for a month, I know that I don't need a new phone to benefit from everything that's on the software side. Yeah, this is the problem with the coronavirus pandemic this year. It's shifted all our timelines out. So where you would normally expect to get the new phone and iOS 14 in this case at the same time, uh, you've had that month where there's been that delay. And that, that, I think, is a problem for Apple this year because, you know, you're right. You're able to look at the software, you're able to try the software, realize that on your iPhone 11 or on your iPhone 10R or even your SE that actually the software is perfectly fine, it's good, it's working, it's giving you all the features. And you know, one of the big questions I get asked a lot is, well, what are the new features that I'll get by buying the new iPhone 12? Um, nothing really. 
You'll get some new features in terms of hardware, like we mentioned, with LiDAR or better cameras uh, or perhaps an OLED screen if you've got even on the iPhone 12 mini and the iPhone 12. But the fact is, in terms of software, there's really no difference. If you're happy with your phone right now and it works for you and you are happy with it and it's going okay, I don't think there's a need to upgrade this year. Uh, Stephen, you mentioned that you're going to be picking up the the, uh, the new iPhone 12 mini. Yeah. But Mitchell, what, what about you? Are you planning on upgrading to the new 12? I am not, and this is kind of unusual because uh, starting, I guess, with the iPhone 10 to the 10s, that was the first time when the iPhone 10s came out that I did not upgrade uh, every year. And this year, I think, as Stephen said, and as you mentioned, this is the first time in history I think Apple's software may cannibalize their sales. Normally, we hear about products cannibalizing other products, where if a product is so good on the lower end, you might not buy the higher end because you don't need to. I think the software is going to cannibalize sales because, as you were saying, I feel like I have a whole new phone. Sorry, I had to do that. Uh, when, when, you know, talk about all the widgets and the fact that you know the, the, the screen is no longer covered when a phone comes, when a call comes in, and just all the new little updates to the software and the fact that my 11 Pro Max is still pretty darn good, and uh, you know, developers haven't even taken advantage of how to use the previous generation chips, let alone the A14 Bionic, which just came out. So for me, I'll be skipping this generation, but because I think they did such a great job on the new, uh, you know, iOS. I feel like I have a whole new phone with my old phone. Yeah, but here's the question. Here's the question, guys. Do either of you think that once you get your hands on one of these phones and you actually get to experience it a little bit, especially you, Mitchell, and probably me, because I don't plan on getting it either, do you think you're going to change your mind when you get it in your hand, Stephen? Um, well, uh, my, my wife gets the joy of having the first iPhone 12 in the family because she wanted the regular iPhone 12, and that, of course, was available for pre-order first. I've got to wait for the iPhone 12 mini, but I do therefore get the joy of trying out the iPhone 12 first and, you know, getting that feeling of that new design and, and seeing what I think. And, and yes, the, the reality is, like you, Mitchell, I'm weak. <laughs> I will absolutely weak. just be saying... <laughs> Take my money, Apple. Take my money. And yeah, that will be it. Yeah. Mitchell, you think if you get your hands on it, you'll actually want it? Well, again, you know how weak I am, Mark and Stephen. You know, we have the same thing going on here. We're, you know, like brothers in that way. But there's something <laughs> yeah. about there's something about electronics that sort of transcend the purpose. Um, and, and again, this is something that everyone can relate to. There's a, there's a feel, there's a smell, there's just this very visceral reaction to a beautiful thing that also has incredible function. And that's something that Apple has been wonderful and amazing at doing over the years is having form and function. And I'm just afraid that once I get the smell and the feel of that device in my hand, that my knees will start to buckle and I'll start to pull out my card, but I'm not going to go anywhere near them. I'm going to show restraint. I'm going to keep myself away. I don't. The answer is I don't know how strong I'll be able to be if I get anywhere near the mark. That's the absolute <laughs> truth. Well, guess what, guys? That being said, I can guarantee you that in a couple months we'll have another episode with all of us being hands-on with the brand new iPhone 12. <laughs> yes. Exactly. <laughs> Thank you guys for being here. If you uh, have an opinion, please email us. The email address is feedback at uh, ami.ca. On Twitter, you can reach out. It is at Double Tap Canada and use that hashtag, which is Ask Double Tap. On behalf of Stephen Scott and Mitchell Whitfield, I am Marco Flalo. Thank you guys for being here. We'll catch you on our next edition of Double Tap TV. Love Double Tap TV? Listen to AMI Audio for Double Tap Canada every Thursday at 8 p.m. Eastern for news and reviews on everything tech. Hosted by Mark Aflalo and Stephen Scott. Editing, Will Attar. Production assistance, Wendy Kaufman. Content review, Zachary Aflalo. Voiceover, Anna Vicino. Integrated described video specialist, Ron Rickford. Coordinating producer, Jennifer Johnson. Director production, Karen Nye. Director programming, Brian Perdue. VP content development and programming, John Melville. President and CEO, David Arrington. Copyright 2020, Accessible Media Inc.